Chocolate. My personal addiction. We can argue whether white chocolate is really chocolate or not. My daughter Shiloh says it isn't, and, you know, I support my baby girl. We can discuss which country has the best chocolate. We can debate the negative effects. We can explore why chocolate may be the, the best friend at every dentist. Regardless of where this dive takes us, we're certainly going to learn about death by chocolate. I'm Scott Parrish, and, I, and you're listening to Dying to Eat. Each episode, we'll be focusing on a different country and exploring the relationship between food and death around the world. If you love food, culture, and fun stories, then I've got a great show in store for you. And don't forget our sponsor, thetailoredhemp.com. For high-quality CBD from the experts, visit thetailoredhemp.com. And make sure to stick around to see what's cooking at the end of the show. Believe it or not, chocolate can be traced all the way back to ancient Mayans and even earlier to ancient Olmecs of southern Mexico. The word chocolate may conjure up images of sweet candy bars and luscious truffles, but the chocolate of today is very little like the chocolate of the past. Throughout much of history, chocolate was revered but a bitter beverage, not sweet edible treat like what we think of today. The most delicious candy is actually made of the fruit cacao located in Central and Southern America. Who says fruit doesn't taste good? The fruits are called pods and each pod contains about 40 cacao beans. The are 40 coca beans. The beans are dried and roasted to create these coca beans that can be used for other processing. The scientific name for the tree that chocolate comes from this Theobroma coca means uh, food of the gods. Hey, I agree with that for sure. Couldn't be anything else, right? Despite its regal background and revered status, the coca bean doesn't just magically turn into chocolate. It takes about 400 beans to make a single pound of the good stuff. It's unclear exactly when coca came on the scene or who invented it or who discovered it, however you want to term it. Uh, according to Hayes Lavis, a cultural arts curator from the, from the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, ancient Olmec pots and vessels from around 1500 BC were discovered with traces of the bean in it. And it is believed that they actually not only ate the chocolate but made tea with it. An interesting side note about the stimulant compound found in chocolate is when I was in grade school, my teacher would put out a piece of chocolate on our desk for a test and allow us to smell it before we tested in order to stimulate our brains. Once we finished, then we got to eat the chocolate, of course. <laughs> kind of tortured us in the meantime, but come to think of it, maybe she was just bribing us to get a good grade. I don't know. I appreciate it, though. And... I think it worked. In all seriousness, she was correct to do this as the smell of chocolate increases theta brain waves, which triggers relaxation, which therefore makes taking a test a little bit easier. Chocolate actually contains high doses of caffeine and sugar. Studies show chocolate products are largely to blame for uh, ADD or ADHD in children. Now, I don't know if I agree with that or not, but that was in our that was in um, our research. It's thought that Omex used cacao to create a ceremonial drink, and um, since they didn't keep any written history, opinions differ if they used the beans in their concoction or whether the pulp from the pod. The Olmecs were friendly enough to pass their cacao knowledge on to the Mayans, who not only consumed the chocolate, but they revered it. Chocolate drinks being used during celebratory times and even are frequently documented in Mayan written history. If only the Olmecs would have been as well documented as the Mayans, we'd know a lot more about this history. It's crazy. Despite chocolate's importance in Mayan culture, it wasn't reserved for the wealthy or the powerful, but readily available to almost everyone. In many Mayan households, chocolate was enjoyed with every meal. Mayan chocolate was thick and frothy and often combined with chili peppers, honey, or water. And that just sounds packed full of flavor, doesn't it? An 
And actually, I've had it with chilies, and that heat against the chocolate is, is delicious. By the 15th century, the Aztecs used coca beans as currency. They believed that chocolate was a gift from the god uh, Cortel, I believe is how you pronounce that, and drink it as a refreshing beverage, and aphrodisiac, and even to prepare for war. The Aztecs took chocolate admiration to a different level. They believe cacao was given to them by their gods. Like the Mayans, they enjoy the caffeinated kick of the hot or cold or spiced chocolate beverages in ornate containers, but they also used cacao beans as currency to buy food and other goods. In Aztec culture, cacao beans were considered more valuable than gold. Which means in today's culture, cacao beans would be considered to be more valuable than Bitcoin. Huh, man, I'm hungry and suddenly wanting to look at my 401k. I wonder, I wonder if we're chocolate heavy on that. Anyway, Aztec chocolate was mostly an upper class extravagance, although the lower classes enjoyed it occasionally at weddings and other celebrations. Perhaps the, perhaps. The most interesting and notorious Aztec chocolate lover of all was the almighty Aztec ru ruler Montezuma II, who su supposedly drank gallons of chocolate every day for energy and as an aphrodisiac. Now that's a couple of times we've said that. I wonder if it works. It's also said he reserved some of his cacao beans for his military. Hey, sign me up, man. I'm ready to go to war. You may find yourself loving or hating Christopher Columbus for discovering America, or at least discovering America that was already occupied by Native Americans. That's a whole other story. We'll get to that uh, in a different show. And you know, he and the others did some terrible things to take the land, but maybe this piece of info will make you like him a little bit more, maybe. Christopher Columbus apparently discovered cacao beans after intercepting a trade ship on a journey from America and brought beans back and brought beans back to Spain with him in 1502. No matter how chocolate got to Spain, by the late 1500s it was much loved and indulgence by the Spanish court and Spain began importing chocolate in 1585. As other European countries, such as Italy and France, visited parts of Central America, they also learned about cacao and brought chocolate back to their prospective countries. Shortly after, it was a wrap. Chocolate mania spread through Europe. With a high demand for chocolate came chocolate plantations, which were worked by thousands of slaves. European palates weren't satisfied with the traditional Aztec chocolate drink recipe. They made their own varieties of hot chocolate with cane sugar, cinnamon, and other common spices and flavorings. Before you knew it, fashionable chocolate houses for the wealthy cropped out all throughout London, Amsterdam, and other major European cities. It took over 139 years to make its way from Spain to America. Chocolate arrived in no other than the wonderful state of Florida on a Spanish ship in 1641. The first American chocolate house opened in Boston 40 years later. From there, America adopted it as their own, and by 1773, cacao beans were a major American colony import, and chocolate was enjoyed by people of all classes. Here's a little nugget of chocolate history. During the Revolutionary War, chocolate was provided to the military as rations and sometimes given to soldiers as payment instead of money. Chocolate was also provided as rations to soldiers in World War II. I remember when I was in the military, we had chocolate out in the field, and it, it was invaluable too, man. You could trade it for just about anything if you didn't want to eat it. But who doesn't want to eat their chocolate, right? So, for much of the 19th century, chocolate was enjoyed as a beverage. Milk was often added instead of water. In 1847, British chocolatier J.S. Fry created the first chocolate bar molded into a paste made of sugar, chocolate liquor, and cocoa butter. Swiss chocolatier Daniel Peter was generally credited with adding dried milk powder to chocolate to create a milk chocolate in 1876. But it wasn't until several years later when he worked with his friend Henry Nestle 
and they created the Nestle Company and brought milk chocolate to the mass market. Chocolate had come a long way during the 19th century, but it was still hard and difficult to chew. In 1879, another Swiss chocolatier, Rudolf Lint, invented the conch machine, which mixed and aerated chocolate, giving it a smooth, melt-in-your-mouth consistency that blended well with other ingredients. By the late 19th century and early 20th century, family chocolate companies such as Cadbury, Mars, Nestle, and Hershey were mass-producing a variety of chocolate confections to meet the growing demand of the national sweet tooth. Chocolate bars soared in popularity during the Roaring Twenties, and by the end of the decade, more than 40,000 different candy bars were being made in the U.S. Father and son duo Frank C. Mars and Forrest Mars Sr. collaborated on the idea for the Milky Way bar, which hit the market in 1923 with a chocolate for its coating supplied by Hershey's. The family-owned business would rival Hershey's and Forrest Mars Sr., later partnered with a son of Hershey's executive, began production of M&M candies in 1941. Talk about sleeping with the enemy. Wow. But, you know, it happens, right? And that's the way big business gets built. At least we got M&Ms out of it, right? H.B. Reese's, what do you kind of candy you think he made, huh? Reese's peanut butter cups. The guy, H.B. Reese's. What kind of candy do you think he made? Reese's peanut butter cups. H.B. Reese's had worked as a dairy farmer and a shipping foreman for Hershey's, and he launched his own candy company in 1923. Five years later, he introduced Reese's peanut butter cups. They later came to be produced by Hershey's and one of the top-selling candies in the United States. Well, I can tell you that. I, I, I've eaten my share of them for sure. I find it fascinating that some of the most popular chocolates today were all made around that same window, though, back in the early 1920s by people who were all kind of connected. It's really fascinating. We, we do live in a small world. So they got in the game at the right time because fast forward to 2016 and the retail sales of chocolate worldwide totaled nearly $100 billion, including $25 billion in the United States alone. That means we eat one quarter of the world's chocolate. By the way, all that chocolate certainly contributes to trips to the dentist. Did you hear about the Oreo cookie that went to the dentist? He lost his feeling. All right. <laughs> okay, most modern chocolate, like most of the foods we put in our body, is highly refined and mass-produced, although some chocolatiers still make their chocolate creations by hand and keep the ingredients as pure as possible. Chocolate is available to drink, but not, but it's more often enjoyed as an edible confection because that's the way that we've progressed with it and that's the way we're used to it, consuming it. While your average chocolate bar isn't considered very healthy, dark chocolate's earned its place as a heart-healthy, antioxidant-rich treat. The points are low enough on Jenny Craig diet and even on the keto diet that you can enjoy them. I've always wanted to know why dark chocolate was healthier than milk chocolate. Well, studies show eating dark chocolate widens the arteries and promotes healthy blood flow that can prevent the buildup of plaque that can block arteries. Therefore, eating dark chocolate every day reduces the risk of heart disease by one-third. Flavonoids found in coca products have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-clotting effects that can reduce the risk of diabetes by improving insulin sensitivity. Now, think about what I just said. Eating dark chocolate will reduce the risk of diabetes. Eating that less fun chocolate can even help the cardiovascular system by reducing high blood pressure. Looks like I may need to change the recipe to something with dark chocolate in it. And let me say, I, I misspoke there a little bit because I would prefer dark chocolate way over milk chocolate. A lot of people, when you ask them their favorite chocolate, and they like to say white chocolate, but I have some really sad news here. White chocolate isn't really chocolate. Score one for Shiloh. Let me tell you why. 
I know, it's a mind-blowing revelation for those of you that don't know. It's because it doesn't contain coca solids or chocolate liquor, meaning it isn't chocolate in the strict sense, but it does contain parts of the coca bean, mainly the coca butter. Have you ever wondered why chocolate melts so deliciously on your tongue? Chocolate is the only edible substance to melt around 93 degrees Fahrenheit, just below the human body temperature. Chocolate, when it melts, even has the tendency to look like blood. That's why it's used in the famous shower scene in that one movie you may remember, Psycho. Next time you watch it, watch for the chocolate. Chocolate has been used to manipulate and coerce people of all ages, not just kids. A jewel thief made off with $28 million of gems in 2007. Because he was able to gain the trust of some guards working at a bank in Antwerp, Belgium, by repeatedly offering them chocolate. Man, I'd like some chocolate. I'd like some money, too. Maybe Belgium's where I need to be. Today, for our special segment, I want to tell you, beautiful human beings, about a gentleman named Henry Purcell. He only lived from 1659 to 1695, but he's considered the greatest English Baroque composer of all time. One says that he died of chocolate poisoning. A little more on that shortly. Another rumor of his cause of death was that he caught a chill when his wife locked him out, uh, out of the house in the rain. Stories of Purcell's triumph, triumphant rise and sudden death at age 36 will be woven around some of the most glorious choral music of this age. Purcell composed music covering a wide field. Church, the stage, court, private entertainment. In all these branches of composition, he showed an obvious admiration for the past combined with a willingness to learn from the present, particularly from his contemporaries in Italy. With alertness of mind went an individual inventiveness that marked him as one of the most original English, English composers of his time, as well as that of Europe. While the rumors of his death circulated heavily, it had been presumed that he actually died of tuberculosis. They do a play about him, though, and even call it Death by Chocolate. The Life of Henry Purcell. Tickets are about 30 bucks, and the show is in Winnipeg, Canada, if you ever decide you want to go see it. Let's talk about deaths that are actually occurred at the hands of chocolate, because we can document this. And I'm not talking about your neighbor's dog here either, so think about the, this story here first. 17th century Mexico, the bishop of Chiapas and the local ladies had a disagreement. Apparently he didn't like them enjoying their bittersweet beverage during Mass. Rumor has it that one of the ladies settled the argument by poisoning his chocolate. True story or not, this perfectly illustrates what can happen when you get between a woman and her chocolate. When Pope Clement the Fourteenth died in 1774. There were whispers that he was poisoned. Once again, the culprit was chocolate. Flash forward to the late 1800s in Britain. That's when Christina Edmonds started her chocolate poisoning campaign. Have you ever heard about her? I don't think a lot of people have. She would buy candy and lace it with strychnine and return it to the store. That's truly an evil person. She did this because she found her romantic feelings for a local doctor knocked back. As the pain from the unrequited love affair became too much, Christina attempted and failed to commit murder, and then in a perverse effort to clear her name, decided to carry out a mass poisoning campaign. Some of the chocolate, it was resold and many people became ill, even one death resulting that was a young boy. She was sentenced to death and later commuted to life in prison. She spent the rest of her life at the Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum. Sounds about right, huh? She died in 1907. Her last meal was a Hershey's Kiss. Sadly, these stories aren't relegated to the past. There are some more recent examples of people using chocolate to kill. In 1976, suspected terrorist Badia Hada died of an alleged, allegedly of being fed poisoned chocolate for six months by Mossad agents. In 2006, a man killed his parents by serving them a chocolate mousse containing poison. He got a 20-year sentence. 
Can chocolate even seem as sweet after reading these stories? You may want to think twice before biting into some bittersweet treat that someone offers you. Think hard. Your life might hang in the balance here. Uh, of course, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Here's an interesting one, though. A woman fights with her husband over a chocolate cake. She claims she attempted to leave with a cake, but her husband objected. They quarreled, and she settled it by stabbing him. Neither the husband nor the cake survived. I know, this is just sad. An 82-year-old man was attacked and robbed by thugs, posing as chocolate salesman. A week later, he died of a heart. A young woman dies while trying to share her chocolate with her co-workers. She attempted to cut the bar into pieces and instead slipped and cut an artery in her leg. They apparently ate the chocolate after the ambulance took her away. <laughs> That's horrible. That is horrible. I'm just reading the news, people. <laughs> An employee of South Bend Chocolate Company was found dead in a company machine. Ironically, he was wearing a Willy Wonka outfit. Wonder what was happening there. A man with an eating disorder crammed an entire Mars bar in his mouth and choked to death. We've reached out to Frank and Forrest Mars. Yeah, who knows? They just had no comment. If you wanted to kill yourself by eating chocolate, you'd have to eat more than 11 pounds of milk chocolate. But, good old dark chocolate, it would only take 6 pounds. That kind of makes it darker, doesn't it? Interesting. Of course, different types of chocolate contain variety, uh, varying amounts of the therobrine, uh, which is the active ingredient in chocolate. On average, milk chocolate contains far less than dark. Milk and other highly processed chocolates contain about 2.4 milligrams of the toxin per gram of chocolate. Dark chocolate contains about 5.5 milligrams per gram. And baker's chocolate, 16 milligrams per gram. So a typical adult human who needs to eat about 75,000 milligrams for it to be toxic. That's roughly, let's see, 711 regular sized Hershey's milk chocolate bars or 7,084 Hershey's chocolate kisses or 332 standard size Hershey's dark chocolate bars. It's not impossible. Dying from chocolate overdose would not be the most surprising way a human was capable of, of taking care of themselves. But majority of healthcare professionals have never seen a case of chocolate poisoning in their career. An elderly man lay dying in his bed. In death's agony, he suddenly smelled the aroma of his favorite chocolate chip cookies wafting up the stairs. He gathered his remaining strength, lifted himself from the bed, leaned against the wall. He slowly made his way out of the bedroom, and with even greater effort, forced himself down the stairs, gripping the railing with both hands. With labor breath, he leaned against the door frame and gazed into the kitchen. Were it not for death's agony, he would have thought himself already in heaven. There, spread upon the newspapers on the kitchen table, were literally hundreds of his favorite chocolate chip cookies. Was it heaven, or was it one final act of heroic love from his devoted wife, seeing to it that he didn't leave this world without one more happy moment? Mustering one great final effort, he threw himself forward to the table, landing on his knees in a rumpled po posture. His parched lips parted, and the wondrous taste of the cookie was already in his mouth, seemingly bringing him back to life. The aged and withered hand shockingly made its way to a cookie that at the edge of the table when he was suddenly smacked with a spatula by his wife. <laughs> Stay out of those, she said. They're for the funeral. <laughs> there you have it, folks. That's history. That's the myths. That's the currency. That's the death by chocolate. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a recipe that's going to be delicious and overly delightful. Gentlemen, if you're married to a good woman, I highly recommend you make this without the poison. And if you're married to a not-so-good woman, you know what? <laughs> I'd just make the right decision if I were you. So death by chocolate. We're going to make death by chocolate cupcakes. You need one 15-ounce box of dark chocolate cake mix. One 4-ounce box of chocolate 
fudge flavored instant pudding. I like the Jello brand. One cup of sour cream, half a cup of vegetable oil, half a cup of prepared plain warm coffee. Don't get experimental or, or overly crazy there. Coffee's coffee for this. Four eggs, one bag of 11 ounce semi sweet chocolate chunks. Now, for the frosting, it's going to be a little different. 11 ounces of premium milk chocolate bars. Dove bars do really good with this. One cup of sour cream. And for garnish, you're going to use strawberries or nuts or chocolate chips or whatever you like. Preheat the oven to 350 degrees. In a large bowl, whisk together cake mix and the pudding mix until it's well combined. Make a well in the center of the bowl. Add in the sour cream, vegetable oil, eggs, and the coffee. Mix for five minutes or until completely combined. The batter will be really thick. I finish it off by stirring it with a rubber spatula. Stir in the semi-sweet chocolate chunks. Fill the cupcake liners about a third full with the batter and bake 16 to 18 minutes. Remove the cupcakes from the pan as soon as they come out of the oven. Let it cool on a cooling rack while you make the frosting. In a large bowl, melt the milk chocolate candy bars in a microwave, stirring every 10 seconds or so until it's completely melted. The Dove chocolate squares take about a minute and a half. Let cool until it's just uh, slightly warm, and then stir in sour cream. Refrigerate it, refrigerate it for 30 seconds or until it's firm enough to hold some peaks. When the cupcakes are cooled, pipe on the frosting. And then, like I said, the garnish, you put what you like on it and enjoy. Now, this recipe is not mine. This is courtesy of Monique Kilgore of Divas Can Cook. Thank you, Monique. I really appreciate the support. I've been your host, Scott Parrish, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Dying to Eat. This show is made possible by listeners like Stephanie Johnson, owner of Jaded Summer Designs. I really appreciate Stephanie's support and the rest of you. If you like what you've heard and you'd like to hear more, look out for new episodes every week on your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share with a friend, and add a five-star review. Follow the show to stay up to date on our latest episodes. And until next time, stay lively.